Welcome everyone back to the School of Greatness <laughs> podcast. Very excited about our guest today. Her name is Amy Purdy. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks I appreciate for it. Me. Appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely. I've been trying to get you on for like three years now, and we I made, know we made it happen. Uh, thanks to my persistence and Julianne Huff making the introduction and yes. all these other things. So I'm, I'm glad you're here and Thank you've been you. traveling a lot and you've got a lot going on. Um, and I told you a story just before we started on camera. Amy stole twenty five thousand dollars. She <laughs> yeah, ripped it from my, my wallet. That's she so took funny. it from my heart. You and know. Um, I was uh, to tell the story. I was, you know, I do speaking just like you do a lot of speaking. It's yes. part of your your business, your brand. And um, this this conference asked me to speak. And they were like, it's down to you and one other person. <laughs> and then they didn't give it to me. And they gave it. And I was like, who is it? And they were like, it's Amy Purdy. I was like, ah, it's tough to. Yeah. It's tough to beat her up, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's all yeah. good. Um, well, that makes me, that I'm actually honored to know, well, this sounds bad, but they chose me over you because you're so amazing, <laughs> though. You know, like, it's, it was between the two of us. <laughs> it's all good. Sorry I look about at, that. There's a world of abundance. There's many speaking yes. opportunities. I'm not worried if we miss yes. one each. But, you know, that is kind of funny. You can put a dollar sign on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you stole $25,000 from me. It's all good, yeah. One day we'll be speaking on the same stage. Yeah, we'll uh, that would be amazing. We'll make it Let's happen. do it. We'll make yeah. It happen. Uh, for those that don't know about your story, you have an incredible story, and um, I want to dive into it. But Oprah essentially said you're like the most inspiring person in the world. And that's crazy. Which is pretty cool, right? It I, is. I don't know if that's the exact quote, but it's something like that. I have it down here somewhere. She's like the person to look up to, someone she, mm. you're inspired by for her. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. It's pretty with all surreal. The, with all the people that she meets and I know. connects with, like you're her inspiration. I, you know, it, it's it's really really surreal mm. because she was my inspiration. Right. You know, going through um, everything that I went through with uh, losing my legs, and you know, we'll get into that a bit too. But just losing my legs and everything I went through. I mean, I spent a lot of down days recovering mm. and watching Oprah and the people that she had on the show. And, you know, you think, oh, my gosh, if those people can get through what they went through, I can get through what I'm going through. Right. And then to be sharing the stage with her and actually the, the fact that Oprah knows who I am, has, you know, <laughs> says my name and knows who I am. I mean, I just feel um, it's so surreal and, and she's just incredible. I mean, wow. you know, she's just a very real human down to earth person, yeah. which I love even more. So that's cool. Yeah. Let's break it down for those that don't know your story. You're you're 19. You're a regular girl, yeah. right? Living in Vegas. <laughs> Vegas. <girl. laughs> Vegas. Yeah. You love to snowboard. You had a regular life. Nothing like too crazy. Nothing mm -mm. too bad. Nothing too out of Exciting the world. Exciting or you it's know, just like you were living your life. Yeah. And then one day, what happened? Yeah. So I, which I have to back up real fast. Sure. You said I was a snowboarder in Vegas, and people question that <laughs> often. But I grew up skiing in Vegas because there's ski resorts outside of Vegas, yeah. and my family skied. And then I fell in love with snowboarding when I was 15, and um, just knew that it would be a part of my life forever. Yeah. And I actually, it kind of shaped what uh, what I did after high school. I went to Salt Lake City to become a massage therapist because my thought was I could travel the world and snow board and have this job that would travel with me. Amazing. I could live in resort towns and, you know, on cruise ships and just see the world with wow. this job, um, but also snowboard. And um, so I ended up going back to Vegas after massage school because I got a job out there. I was saving money to be able to travel and kind of do all that fun stuff. And that's when really my, you know, plans changed. I completely went on a detour. Uh, when I got sick with something called meningococcal meningitis. And we have no idea how I got it. Mm -hmm. um, all we know is that they say 25% of the population carries it. Wow. Um, and it's just a form of meningitis. So there's spinal meningitis, then there's bacterial meningitis. Spinal's not as deadly or bad as bacterial. Bacterial you is bacterial. really... bacterial. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... <clears throat> Bacterial is really deadly. We have, uh, we really don't know how I got it. It's airborne. So I could have been in an elevator at work and somebody sneezed on me and my body just didn't wow. fight it off because they say it lives on your nose and your mouth. Um, and it's something we're in contact with all the time, but mm. our immune systems know to fight off. Right. And so, you know, otherwise everybody would be sick from it. Right. Um, and I just happened to be one of those people that for whatever reason, my immune system didn't fight it off. And within 24 hours of my first flu-like symptom and it was just you know I just didn't feel good had a slight fever just yeah. thinking I had the flu within 24 hours of that I was in the hospital on life support given less than a two percent huh. chance of living 
Um, so fought for my life for, you know, weeks to months after that. And, um, in the hospital still for, yeah. So I was in the hospital for about two and a half months. Wow. The first, this is in Vegas. This is in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just, I honestly just entered the hospital feeling really sick and had no idea that I'd be, I mean, I was on my deathbed, like within 24 hours, I was absolutely fighting for my life and, uh, put into an induced coma because they didn't know what I had at this point. So I entered the hospital. They had no idea what I had except that I was in septic shock. All my organs were failing and hemorrhaging, um, everything but my heart and my brain. So all my other organs were hemorrhaging and not working. And so they put me on life support right away, told my parents I had um, less than a 2% chance of living. This is in 24 hours, right within those next day. Yes, within the next day. And, uh, and then I was immediately put on, um, put into an an induced coma because, uh, my body was completely shutting down and that's how they try to kind of stabilize you a little it calms bit. Calms you down a little bit. Yeah. So it you're not have to work fighting hard. so hard. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. And <clears throat> what does that mean? They just give you a drug or what do they do? Yeah, how do you go in and they do, they give you some kind of, I forget what it's called, but they do, they give you some kind of um, thing in your IV. And I remember my, and it was a really big deal. You just go to sleep. Yeah. <clears throat> my, it, it was really hard for my parents. You can imagine because at, you know, they didn't know if they'd see me again. Oh my so gosh. this was like, I remember I actually was awake when my dad signed the papers to like basically put me on life support. So like, you may not wake up, yeah. but this is the only option but essentially. You're going to, you'll die if we don't do this. Oh and my so, gosh. Yeah. So, um, because I wasn't breathing, oh, not that I wasn't breathing good. I was, um, I was gasping for air because my oh. lungs had failed. So, oh or my gosh. had collapsed. So, uh, I, I just remember you know, br- gasping for air and, uh, and that my dad was signing this paperwork and everyone was crying. And that was like my last <laughs> memory. Was like, See you guys never. Oh my God. Yeah. And, were you but freaking you know, out? were you scared? You were know you... what? There's always humor in yeah, tragedy. Of course. And I remember it feeling so surreal, like an outer body experience and thinking, you guys, aren't we taking this a little seriously? <laughs> you know, you said this even, even though I was, I didn't, but it was in, it was kind of mm. in the back of my head, even though I was like <clears throat> gasping for air and I'm like, I'm dying, I'm dying. I'm, you know, but in the back of my mind, somehow there was this disconnect of like, everybody here thinks I'm going to die. And isn't that a little, um, I don't know, serious for the situation. There's something I, I and it, maybe it was like a separation of, um, of, you know, like your, I don't know. It's like a survival thing yeah. of not thinking that you think. You, you feel think, like it, you right? You feel like you're dying, <laughs> but then you're questioning, am, am I really dying? You wow. know? So, um, yeah, it was, uh, so I remember that. And actually my feet were really, really cold because mm. I had um, septic shock. So you go into septic shock when your body pulls blood from your extremities to save your organs. And that's what was happening. So I was losing circulation to my hands, to my feet, mm. to my nose, my ears, and my chin. It was like tingly feeling or like numbing? I mean, I had no feeling. Freezing cold and purple. Wow. Like just literally overnight. Like huh. it happened really, really fast. So, um, but my feet hurt so bad. So right before they put me into this induced coma, I asked my dad or I like demanded to see my feet because I remember saying, my feet hurt so bad. Um, can I see what's going on? And my dad was like, your feet are the least of our worries here. But I, I demanded to see my feet. And so my dad pulled the sheets back and my feet were literally purple. Oh, wow. And um, no wonder they hurt. <laughs> yeah, right. They were losing all circulation. And then I, I went into the induced coma. And so that's my very last oh memory my gosh. before. I'm surprised you couldn't even remember that. You know, I remember so <clears throat> much um, wow. of that time. You know, you would think that you would kind of black it out mm-hmm. because it's a traumatic time. I remember so many details. Mm. It's really interesting. So, yeah, I ended up in that induced coma for about two and a half weeks. And then you're kind of in and out you know, like I was awake and then all of a sudden you kind of slip back into it. You're in and out for a little bit Mm. for say another like week or so. And then, um, but I still was on life support when I woke up. I still, um, because I was in kidney failure, my spleen had burst and was removed. Um, Mm. my kind of everything was out of whack. And so I was still hooked up to machines when I awoke from the coma. Mm. I still had tubes down my throat because my lungs had 
collapsed and needed help breathing. And so I was awake during a period of time where I was hooked up to like a whole room of machines, but aware of what was going on. Oh my gosh. And, um, I, yeah, then I ultimately ended up losing both of my legs below the knees, almost lost my hands. And, uh, that was from the septic shock. So they did everything they could to the try to bring me out of that septic shock to try to get more circulation to my feet because that's just a natural it's pretty amazing it's a natural response to your body Hmm. trying to save itself is your organs are failing so let's pull blood from your extremities to save your organs and that's just the body's natural response which is pretty amazing but because of that i lost circulation to my my legs and my hands so when you woke up uh, the first time, did you already lose your legs? or No. So I woke up, and um, my feet <clears throat> at this point were – the the bottoms of my feet were black. Oh. I mean, like ah. – and my toes, like it's kind like, of it's mummy. Like, it's <laughs> like snowboarding. I know, <laughs> but to the extreme. But, yeah, I mean, like frostbite, really. It like is, you yeah. just – I mean – yeah, there the balls of my feet or the the soles of my feet. Oh my goodness! And my toes had just, I mean, zero circulation. The tops they were of dead, my feet, they were dead. Absolutely, oh the my gosh. the tops of my feet were purple-ish, <sighs> and you, so you know painful. they were. At that point, it actually wasn't. It was um, really weird. It was painful before, you know, when I first entered the hospital. But when I woke up from the coma. It wasn't painful. It was just um, confining. I just wanted to move my toes. I wanted to like feel the yeah. air between my toes and just felt like, you know, like I couldn't, I could, I could kind of move my feet. I could kind of move my toes, but mm-hmm. I was every day losing the ability to do that. Wow. Um, and so then I, it was a couple weeks after I woke up from that coma. I would th- first of all, they tried to save my feet it was pretty much my feet it's above the ankle about two inches is where I was affected and so they tried to save I always say my legs because now I'm in actual prosthetic legs but they they wanted to bring me to a hyperbaric oxygen chamber to try to infuse my tissues with oxygen but I was too unstable Um, they couldn't move me from my hospital bed or anything and and then they would you know do, they'd bring in physical therapists and massage and rub creams that are really bad for you, but that like bring yeah, yeah. blood flow. Um, they were doing everything they could and ultimately just, they knew that if they didn't amputate, if they didn't amputate my feet, that it um, would spread. It would, go. It would spread. Yeah, yeah. It's because it turns into gangrene, basically. Ugh. And gangrene can spread really, really fast within minutes to hours. It's just suddenly once it hits, you're kind of trying to, you're amputating higher and higher. Ugh. So I have to say, though, I got lucky. I know a lot of people who either died from meningococcal meningitis um, or survived it, but lost their legs to their hips, you know, their arms and yeah. their legs. And it's because that gangrene set in really fast for them. I, for whatever reason, had five weeks where it didn't set in. And so that was, they were, you know, doing everything they could. But then they knew by blood tests that it was about ready to. So I I just remember the doctor coming in and saying, we have to do this tomorrow. We have to amputate your legs tomorrow. They told you then. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's amazing where the strength comes from because I didn't cry. I just said, okay, do it. Like, do what you have to do so I can get out of here and move on with my life. Wow. I was just ready. You know, there's certain things that you, there's no debate. Like, this is what has to happen to survive. So let's make, let's Cut my legs off. Right. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So imagine what that'd be like. You can't. And I could have never imagined. But when you're in that moment and the pain, you know, you're surviving for your life. And there wasn't a lot of pain. Um, It's good. But there was survival. I mean, I was so absolutely in survival. You're going mode. a different mode, probably. Totally you're sure different. Your mind, your everything. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. And here, I'm an emotional person, just by nature. Like I, I mean, I could look at a sunset and cry. Like I, I might. <laughs> you said you looked at the photo on your. Yeah, I look at you, that with photo. The American flag and your. Yeah. And I want to cry. So <clears> you would think that I would be the biggest baby in that situation, but somehow I was probably stronger than wow. you know the majority of my family. Even they were the ones who were so heartbroken and crying and I was kind of like do what you gotta do so I can move on with my life everything's gonna be fine I'll figure it out wow I just had that some kind of faith and confidence that that was going to be the case but you know 
It's weird. You just survival mode is an interesting thing. You cut the emotion out of it. That's what it mm. is. You know, you're not like, oh, you know, it's sad. You're not about crying about your legs. You're like, I gotta move on. Yeah, you're like, this, this I gotta do whatever I have to do in this moment yeah, to survive and get through the day. Yeah, if you were probably like in the wilderness and for a month or whatever, you would. Whatever, yeah. eat a bunny rabbit if you had to. You, you would just be like, well, I got to eat it. Right. I can't cook it or, yeah. you know, whatever. And you probably have a period of time of the emotional, like, because it's the attachment yeah. of things. Like, no, I have to and survive. Then, exactly. Then you go into, like, survival, like, yeah. beast mode. And that's... Kind <laughs> <Just> of <laughs> rip a salmon for the... <laughs> yeah. uh, whatever. It's like... Right. Uh, Bear grill stuff. You know? <laughs> right. Um, crazy. And I, and I read somewhere that you kind of had, like, a moment when you were either in your uh, coma... Um, where you like saw you were either going to go into like death or come back to life. Was there like yeah. a thing you saw people, there was three people or something. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I really don't tell the story very much. I've never met anyone who had, who's had a story like this. Yeah. Who they've like seen the light had essentially. Near death experience. Yeah. It, um, so I'm interested. It shaped my life. So that's why it's, it's so important for me. But, um, so when I was, when I was in the coma that I was in and I was, um, it was that first week, which was the most critical when I was mm -hmm. in the hospital. So it was really kind of touch and go as far as um, I was hooked up to all these machines. And, uh, and this is just, you know, I heard this from my nurses, doctors, and parents because I was out of it, obviously. But right. um, my blood pressure would crash and my heart rate would shoot up. It was 244 beats per minute. And it actually stayed oh. that way for about a week and a half, just fluttering in my chest. Wow. And so for one, they said if I wasn't as young as I was or as strong as I was, because I was working out a lot at that time, that my heart probably wouldn't have been able to sustain that. Right. But um, so my, my blood pressure would crash, my heart rate would go up, then my heart rate would crash, my blood pressure would go up, and it was just this constant um, all day for, you know, a couple days there of just uh, being on the edge. They, mm. They'd think <clears throat> that I was going, bring my whole family in, everybody no would start praying, all of a sudden I'd come back. <clears throat> oh yeah, there was a lot of that that happened, and then they had to come in with the chest shockers and shock no my heart way. back into the rhythm. And so the first few days for my oh family my was just, I mean, a every, nightmare. yeah, every five minutes was a kind of a different story for those few days. And so at the same time, um, apparently my stomach started to get kind of bigger and, um, and they were taking my blood and realizing that my red blood count was low. So they realized I was internally bleeding oh and <laughs> here I was so unstable as it was, I was hooked up to all these machines. They couldn't even, I, I actually remember this at one point for some reason. I remember this. I remember like, you know, when you, okay, you know, when you're um, falling asleep and you, you dream that you fell off a cliff or something, mm, you jump, you wake up. Or yeah. Whatever. I remember having a moment like that and my finger twitching and um, hearing all the machines in the room go off and them slamming my hand down because just that motion made my whole wow. body go out of whack. So that's why they had me in that induced coma was to kind of paralyze me to not sure. move at all. But I was that unstable and then they had to um, move me into CAT scan to see what was going on. And um, I guess it took an entire day and like eight doctors to move me from the hospital bed to the CAT scan bed because they had to move just finger, oh like fingertip God. by fingertip <clears throat> without, you know, disrupting my heart rate and all that stuff. And so once they got me to CAT scan, they found out that my spleen um, was about ready to burst. It was 10 times its normal size. Wow. And so they rushed me immediately into, into surgery and... I mean, at that point, my parents and my family thought, you know, that, well, they, I mean, it was a good chance. I was absolutely going to die if I didn't do the surgery, but there was a huge chance I was going to die by doing the surgery because right. I was so unstable as it was. Wow. Um, the amputee or. No, this for my spleen. Oh, wow. Okay. Sorry. The so first, my, my first surgery. Yes. This first is the many. first surgery. First of many. Yeah. So my spleen was 10 times its normal size oh, and, and bleeding uh, internally. And bleeding yeah. internally. Gosh, so, I'm just um, hearing this. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. If you have any kind of weird, like needle <laughs> medical blood, you know, phobias, then it's probably not the story to listen <laughs> right, to, right, but, right. um, but anyways, so, um, I was rushed into emergency surgery so they could remove my spleen. And I remember being in that surgery. So mm -hmm. even though I was in a coma, I remember being in that surgery. And I remember actually looking up 
even though my eyes were taped shut and everything, I remember it was, it was a bit of an outer body experience because I remember looking up, seeing the doctor, um, hearing what the doctors and the nurses were talking about. I remember the doctor, um, his name is Dr. Abby. I write about him quite a bit in my book because he's just a really important part of my life. But mm-hmm. I remember Dr. Abby uh, whispering in my ear and he said, Amy, whatever it is you believe in, think about that now. Oh, this makes me want to cry. Wow. I don't talk about this very much. But uh, so he said, think about that now, whatever oh. religion, whatever it is you believe on, and hang on to that right now. And so before I rem- you're going under. Yeah. Wow. And I remember, well, I was under, I was already under, I was in a coma. Gotcha. This was kind of an outer body thing. This was like I a beginning wow. of this near death experience thing. So um, I remember him whispering that to me, you know, he's not necessarily aware that I'm aware that he was Mm. saying that but I remember him saying that and I remember thinking so he said everything you know whatever it is you think whatever it is you believe in think about that right now and I remember just the first thing that popped to my head is I thought I believe in love Mm. I believe in love and I was raised it was kind of interesting I was raised kind of um kind of Mormon because my grandparents were Mormon and so I'd go to church with them Mm. every other Sunday but I wasn't really raised in a Mormon household Um, but I knew a bit of that religion but I also knew that my friends had different religions and I I never um, I never felt religious but I always felt spiritual Mm -hmm. and um, and it's just interesting in that moment when I was asked what is it you believe in like I believe in love Mm. You know, I think love is the creator of everything and, and what it boils down to in the end. And uh, so I thought of that. And then all of a sudden, um, so my heart was like beating out of my chest and I could feel it. I could feel it fluttering in my chest. And I thought I was actually in open heart surgery because I remember feeling the doctor with no pain, but I remember the pressure feeling him cut me open from my sternum down to my belly button. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but there was no pain. It was just like I could feel the skin and the, everything the pressure, kind of pull apart. Like the yeah. tension or whatever, yeah. The tension. And oh. um, I thought I was in sur- heart surgery because my aunt ha- has the same scar, and she had heart surgery when she was young. And I could feel my heart beating in my chest, and I was thinking, okay, he's here to fix my heart. But um, – but anyways, as my heart was beating, it was beating faster and faster and faster. And I just, I felt like I was hanging on by my fingertips, just <laughs> on a cliff. And, you know, every time my heart um, hit a beat, I felt like I was going closer and closer to the edge. I mean, I was absolutely hanging on for dear life. And then all of a sudden, I remember feeling my last heartbeat. And it was incredibly powerful and just knocked the breath out of me. And suddenly, I was in this space and uh, in this dark space, and um, I saw a light. It wasn't a bright light. It was kind of a dimmed um, green haze. Um, but there was just enough of a light to see that there were three silhouettes. And I didn't recognize these silhouettes. Um, they're very basic. You know, there wasn't any details, mm-hmm. except I could see their hands um, going like this, like in a in a kind of come here Mm. motion and they were saying to me you can come with us or you can stay and I remember getting so frustrated and thinking I haven't lived my life yet I haven't fallen in love yet I Mm. haven't traveled the world yet I haven't like I love life I haven't done all these things that I always thought that I would do and I remember getting just so frustrated and screaming, no, like every cell in my body. I was like, I'm not going anywhere. And right then, this really bright light, so this I can say was the brightest white light Mm -hmm. I've ever seen, was sitting over my right shoulder. And it was basically saying um, kind of like, okay, you chose to stay. And, um, you know, your life is going to be challenging, but there's, there's, Basically, there's, I'm, I'm putting this in my own words, but because I can't remember exactly mm-hmm. the words, but basically there's going to be um, mountaintops and valleys. You know, there's going to be constant up and downs, but um, just know that it will all make sense in the end. Mm-hmm. And that's so clear to me that it will wow. all make sense in the end. And so when I woke up from the coma that I was in, that was my first thought of what I had gone through. And I think that faith of whatever it is 
just knowing that it will all, no, how, no matter how challenging life gets, no matter what our circumstances are, that it is all going to make sense in the end. That is what helped to get me through the toughest days of my life. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Where do you think you'd be right now if uh, this didn't happen to you or for you? You know, exactly. I love that. Um, <clears throat> I I don't know because I certainly didn't know how, you know, like passionate or strong or motivated I was. I don't know if that all just engaged after I went through everything or yeah. if it was always kind of in. I know it was always in me. It's just bringing it out. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I mean, I wanted to be a massage therapist, travel the world. I'll tell you what. I wanted to, <clears throat> I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to snowboard. And now that is exactly what I'm doing, right. just in a completely different way than I ever expected. Without the massage. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> now I get massages, <laughs> yeah, exactly. which is even better, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, I think we all want to make a difference in the world somehow. Like we all have mm -hmm. a drive to actually just to do something and live a fulfilling life and hopefully positively affect people. Right. And now... I'm doing that because of what I went through. Right. You know, I, right. I, um, I used to want to move to LA out here because I thought I want to act and I want to do all this stuff. But I think what I was craving was I just, I just wanted to do something. And I guess it's, I think some of it is being recognized for mm. something, yeah. you know, I think maybe everybody feels that. And when I was younger, I used to think it's, oh, be on TV. Yep. And now I realize, no, it's actually connecting with people. Like, that's what, that's what I, I want. You're sharing this love and encouragement and positivity and whatever that energy is between people. That's, I think, something that we all want, maybe uh, without knowing it. Yeah. And once you are able to do that, like we're able to do through speaking, yeah. um, you're like, that's what it is. So fulfilling. Yeah. So, okay, so after you had that experience and then you had to, you know, remove your legs, essentially mm -hmm. cut part of your legs. Is it above the knee, below the knee? Below the knee. It's below the knee. right above the ankles. Above the ankles. Mm -hmm. Is that better if it's below the knee? Because then you have the yes. joint to be able to still use. Yes. If way, it was above the knee, it'd be much harder. Way harder. Okay. Yes. Below the knee is a blessing. Wow, it's good. Yeah. And so when you... This happened, and you wake up, and they're not there. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? Yeah, so then I, I remember um, the day the doctor came in and said, if we don't, it basically he said, if we don't <clears throat> amputate here, and he pointed pointed to my ankles, uh -huh. then he said, we'll have to amputate up here next week, and he <sighs> pointed to my knees. So he was like, we, you know, we have to do this. And so um, I remember being um wheeled into the surgical room oh my gosh i know and it's so crazy because how do you wrap your head around oh that, my gosh you know? and um you know it's about to happen yeah you're not going to be there yep and you have no idea what your life is going to be like you know i i actually visualized the only amputees i had ever seen were like you know and it's sad were vietnam vets on the corner in a, in a wheelchair, wheelchair with a sign and I thought that's the only vision I have in oh. my head of what life is like as a leg amputee. And I was getting ready to have that happen to me. But I remember I gave myself, um, I gave myself kind of three goals as I was going into the, like literally as they were wheeling hmm. me from my room into the um, surgical room, I gave myself three goals. And I think I did this because I needed to feel some kind of control, yeah. you know, and, um, I knew that, uh, well, one of those goals was that I was going to snowboard that year. And <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> I guess I, I, now wow. I realize I've, I'm just that type of person where I'm like, I throw myself into things wow. like I'm going to get in shape and I'm going to do it every single day until I'm there. Mm. I have 30 days to get in shape or, you know, for that, it was like, I'm snowboarding, but I'm snowboarding this year. Wow. Um, and then I knew that uh, when I figured it out, or I, the other goal is when I do figure it out, I want to somehow help other people, um, mm -hmm. let them know that it's going to be okay. But I first have to figure that out, you, you know, figure myself. Out <laughs> and, How to be okay with it, yeah. Yeah. And then um, the third goal, you know, it's funny. I, all of a sudden, I'm spacing the third goal as I'm sitting here. Um, so it was, yeah, well, you'll have to read my book and you'll see what the <laughs> we'll third goal We'll see it in there, yeah, yeah. But... Um, 
I think, you know, the idea there is just that I needed something to feel in control of mm. and to get me um, through that experience, something to look forward to. Yeah. Like I said, I would do this. I said I would snowboard this year, so I'm going to do that. Mm. And so I, yeah, I was wheeled in. Um, they amputated my legs above the ankles. And, and then that was when a whole new, I stepped into a whole new mm. life and journey. Wow. So... Did you snowboard then that year? I did. I snowboarded. Um, so I snowboarded about, I'd say, <clears throat> seven months after I lost my legs. Amazing. And that was about four months after I got my prosthetics. And wow. it wasn't comfortable. There <laughs> was, uh, it was definitely, you know, my ankles didn't move because your ankles can move so much. You know, if you can imagine mm -hmm. you keep your feet flat and you can bend your knees to the floor, right? That's how you jump or that's how you, you know, get in an athletic mm -hmm. stance but with um prosthetic legs our ankles don't bend i mean even really the best prosthetics your ankles bend very very little because um if you have too much motion then you're kind of all over the place mm -hmm. you can't control it so my ankles were very stiff and i actually remember the day that i tried to snowboard again i went up with my sister and, um, you know, just put my normal gear on everything. I remember everything felt so weird trying to just even walk in the snow and not feel my feet. Huh. And, you know, I was kind of <laughs> slipping around. And then as we were on the chairlift going up, I think that's when it really hit me kind of the fear of what if I can't do this? Mm -hmm. That's when it hit me because the whole time that seven months I kept thinking, I'm going to snowboard. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get my legs. I'm going to walk. I'm going to learn to snowboard. Whatever I need to do to snowboard. But then all of a sudden that moment was there. And you're like, and now thought, what? <laughs> yeah. What if I yeah. can't? And um, so that was kind of a frightening chairlift ride to the top. Hmm. But when I got off the lift, I was able to kind of cruise on my board. You know, you stop, you buckle in. So all that went okay. Then I got up and I was just able to kind of point my board and go straight. Um, you know, felt completely different, couldn't feel my feet mm -hmm. at all. And <laughs> then I remember uh, I, I carved on my heel edge and, and everything felt okay. And then I went to carve on my toe edge mm -hmm. and that's when I realized, oh my gosh, my ankles don't bend. I can't really get to my toes. But I ended up hitting this bump and my, uh, my beanie went one way, my goggles went the other way. And I mean, I fell and my legs well my legs still attached to my snowboard went flying down the mountain no way so <laughs> oh my gosh i kind of broke into pieces and meanwhile you know <laughs> i'm sitting at the top of the mountain totally embarrassed just like had no idea that you know i would worry about my legs actually Falling coming off, off. Wow. yeah and my friend um <laughs> hiked down the mountain and picked my legs up oh my attached gosh. the snowboard and hiked them back up and what's funny is somebody on the chairlift screamed because you know i'm sure it was didn't know it was like yeah. Oh like, my God, she just broke her legs yeah, off. Yeah, she was like, oh my God. And I'm sure she racked up years of therapy bills, oh you know, God. after that. She probably went home and was like, I am never right. learning to ski and snowboard again because I saw a girl break into millions of pieces. <laughs> and it's funny because we, we always say with skiers, um, if, if a skier falls, we usually call it a yard cell because their skis come yeah, off yeah, yeah, yeah. and then their, the you know, poles. beanie comes yeah. off and their poles. Yeah, they have all this stuff around them. And so this was kind of the ultimate yard cell <laughs> because I had all that around me. Your body me came off too. And feet flying down the mountain. Um, so, <laughs> so I you're was... you 20 years old at this time, right? Yeah. Tw wow. Mm -hmm. And I was really um, discouraged. I, I was also, I was still quite sick. I mean, I was 83 pounds when I left the hospital. Oh, wow. I still at that point was probably under 100 pounds. And hook, I hooked up to um, dialysis machines every night because my kidneys... Um, were in full kidney failure. Oh. So I was still quite weak, um, wow. but I felt at least strong enough to get up and try yeah. to snowboard. And, uh, but it really, you know, that motivated me. I, I was definitely discouraged when that happened, when my legs didn't move the way I needed them to, um, when they came off. But I remember thinking, okay, so if I can find a way to get my ankles to move the way they need to, if I can find a way to keep these legs attached to me, then I can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just about kind of minimizing the overall emotion of, oh my God, I just can't to wait a second. These are very tangible things. Yeah. One step at a time. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah. So, um, I ended up going 
going home from there and and kind of knowing what I needed to do Mm -hmm. and I went on this mission to figure out what kind of feet to use for snowboarding and um, came to find out that uh, that there were no snowboard feet feet out there you know it's not something that you can just go to a shop and buy snowboard feet (laughs) this was what like uh, how many years ago was this gosh this was like 14 years ago probably actually longer this was 16 years ago wow yeah so it's already so probably wasn't as advanced in prosthetics then either right I'm still, I'm in the exact same leg setup I was in 16 years ago. Really? So, yeah, I mean, even though there are there have been advancements, for sure, with the military, and you uh-huh. see a lot of these bion- bionic um, prosthetics coming out, I mean, first of all, so far, there's really, there's nothing that mimics the human yeah, dynamic tough. body, you know? Yeah. And um, there's a lot of research that goes into arm prosthetics because... You know, people who lose their hands, you do so much with your hands that they are putting a lot of research into, you know, people being able to even feel, you know, hot and cold with yeah. their fingertips or hold a baby or, you know, actually have some kind of feeling there. With leg prosthetics, there's there actually has been a lot of advancements if you're above the knee. Just in the last probably um, 10 years, they developed computerized knees wow. that think like a thousand times a second and know what movement you're going to do and want to do so that's amazing but when you're below the knee um it's pretty basic i mean there there is some computerized ankles out there i've sure. tried one i was in i went to mit and tried these awesome um biomechanical ankles right and i will say certain things were amazing that i missed and i didn't realize that i missed like for example when you're sitting say you're sitting and your legs are crossed mm-hmm. normally your foot um, kind of drops a little bit, yeah. right? Like you can kind of, you don't point your toe, but it just kind of drops. But with prosthetics, I mean, your foot's just stuck. Like I'm in a yeah. 90 degree angle. It's sure, the sure. same shape all the time. Right. And I never realized. It kind of how... looks like it's dropped a little bit almost. Well, I'm in a high Maybe heel. Maybe it's the shoe that makes it. Yeah. I have three inches heels yeah. on today. So it looks that way. Right. But you know, it's not, it's not going to drop anymore. And if I was yeah. in tennis shoes, then it's really at a it's 90 more, degree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And there's little things like that that do bother you. Um, mm. And you realize, you know, as a girl, as a woman, like there's feminine little things like yeah. that. Like, you you know, you point your toes that all of a sudden I couldn't do. And do. But when I tried these um, amazing computerized ankles on, uh, it did that. It's like wow. it automatically it knows your legs are crossed. That's and so cool. it drops. Or um, walking... Just walking upstairs, uh, if you can imagine, mm-hmm. you know, you roll off the balls of your foot. That's a dynamic motion. Well, prosthetics don't do, do that. that. No, it's like I'm in ski boots all the time. Oh my Everything gosh. is just set. So Stiff. I'm really just like stepping in the middle of my foot, yeah. you know, the whole time. But with those um, computerized ankles, it actually Moved. pushes off the ball of the foot. And it's like you get up the stairs so fast. Why don't you use those? Because they made me like six feet tall uh, <laughs> yeah they may be way too tall because there was they haven't figured out how to shrink mm, the computer down to be for somebody like me gotcha they were just too tall and made me too tall and i will say this too they were fun but there's something about um i like being able to control my feet instead of my feet control me mm. and so actually now when i snowboard i actually snowboard in quite um i don't want to say basic feet i i kind of created these feet to snowboard in to move the way i need them to yeah. but they're they're quite dead they're not like shocks and springs mm. and like super high tech use your knees and your everything else is shock and, and spring right well th- the thing is though so even though i have my knees if your ankles don't bend, your knees don't bend. Mm. Because yeah, try, like if you were to stand yeah. up right now, you know, yeah, like yeah, kind of, it. it all works together. Mm. Um, so even though I have my knees, they're, the motion's limited because my ankle motion is limited. But I, I tried actually, the next time I snowboarded, I went up with these feet that had shocks and springs. They were these mm. high athletic feet. And I bounced all over the place. Wow. You know, I'd hit chatter and I'd, you know, it bounced all around. Yeah. Yeah, And I thought, okay, it's actually better to go back to the basic feet so that I can control them. And I find that just with day to day, um, walking and, and other activities, I I kind of like being in control and making them do Mm -hmm. what I want them to do instead of all of a sudden them getting a glitch and like, okay, we're running. I guess we're running. (laughs) Right, right. But so when did you decide that, okay, uh, 
maybe I can go to the Olympics, the Paralympics, and compete. When when did that dream happen? Funny that it didn't happen until after I lost my legs. You know, I never had, I I never had a dream to go to the Olympics. And I think part of it is because snowboarding wasn't an Olympic sport when I first started doing it. Um, It didn't become an Olympic sport until really until around the time that I lost my legs. And um, I think so after I lost my legs, I was realized or I I was aware that snowboarding was in the Paralympics or was I can't talk, but snowboarding (laughs) was in the Olympic Games. And once I realized that I could do it, I Uh, thought, well, why isn't snowboarding in the Paralympic Games? It wasn't yet. No. And so um, my now husband, but he was my boyfriend at the time, Daniel, we started a nonprofit organization called Adaptive Action Sports. Uh, We get youth, young adults, and wounded vets all with permanent physical disabilities into action sports. So snowboarding, skateboarding, wakeboarding. We even do rally car racing, motocross, wow, that's cool. um, all types of, you know, the action sports that I always loved. We kind of just figured out, you know, I can do all of these things. So why aren't more people doing these things? Yet there were a lot of people, a lot of amputees that were skiing and swimming, doing more classic sports. So we wanted to bring um, these opportunities to people with disabilities so yeah. they can do these other types of sports and part of what we had a goal of was trying to get snowboarding into the wow. Paralympic Games and so we kind of went on this mission um, teaching snowboard lessons to people who have you know never snowboarded before but then also trying to find the snowboarders out there uh, over the years I had created kind of this not not that I created it but you know you kind of attract people around you I I had this like community of people who all snowboarded and had prosthetics and everybody was riding amazing but individually in their own like little mountain town or in Canada there would be somebody with a prosthetic who snowboarded so we all started coming together and um hitting up every single snowboard competition Uh, with our organization adaptive action sports we would create adaptive divisions to um snowboard competitions usa say national snowboard competition Mm. we created an adaptive division with that the espn x games we created an adaptive skateboard division and then we did an adaptive um, snowboard division to the espn uh, winter x games which we still run the border cross and so we started you guys, just your organization runs it. Yeah, wow, so my cool. husband runs that. Wow. Mm-hmm. And um and so we started um you know helping to create this community of people who rode incredibly well and wanted to see it in the games. I mean, it's amazing for years on our own dollar with literally barely any money in our pocket, we'd fly to New Zealand yeah. and um, compete out there and fly to Europe and compete out there. And we had zero sponsors, <laughs> no idea if this would ever be a Paralympic sport. Wow. There was kind of a core group <clears throat> of probably maybe 20 of us that made it happen. And uh, we were successful ultimately in getting snowboarding. It, our first games was the 2014 um, Paralympics in Sochi. And so that's the one you competed in? Yes. And got a bronze medal? Yes. What was the event? What was it? It's border events. cross. Border cross. Mm-hmm. It so, wasn't half pipe. It wasn't no. like you're doing tricks. And- no. Um, <clears throat> no. I used to love to do that kind of stuff when I had legs. It's definitely a lot more complicated now. Yeah. But I'll tell you, even, I mean, border cross is one it's of the fast. most complicated sports I probably, uh, any an amputee could ever do. I because you need to be so dynamic. That's it. You need your ankles. You need <laughs> ankles. Yeah. You need ankles for multiple reasons. Because, so um, border cross, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like motocross, but down snow. Because mm-hmm. every, there's four to six people who come out of the start gate at the same time. You immediately go over these jumps as separation Man, features. Man, tough. Yeah, and then it's you're fast. around berms and more jumps and berms and more jumps, and you're just weeding each other out. Um, you know, whoever crosses the finish line first <clears> wins, <throat> right. moves on to the next, next round, round. Yeah. and it's an all-day kind of thing of competing against each other until you get the winner. And I'm the only double-leg amputee competitive really? snowboarder worldwide right now at that level. Huh. There's <clears> some um, – this year we, we actually met a couple new – double leg amputee guys who are starting to train That's and cool. hopefully get you know work their way up but for all these years it's just been me with two prosthetic Ooh. legs and um, so I race against girls who have their legs or who have one prosthetic leg mm-hmm. and you know just missing them, an arm some are missing arm or they have their own category so now if you're an gotcha. arm if you're kind of an upper limb uh-huh. and, um, gotcha. impairment you're in one category if you're a <clears throat> lower limb impairment you're in another category gotcha. mostly it's just one limb 
mostly it's one limb. Yeah. Very few people are double yeah. and actually have figured out their equipment and had the drive to actually yeah. like, you know, make it to the point where you can compete. And this was like 12 years of training for you. Yes. Right? And just constant oh innovation, gosh. constant yeah. um, creativity to try to figure out how to get my feet to do the uh, to move the way I want them to move. And to be honest, they're still not there. Um, they're not there. I mean, the other girls, you know, they, everybody is uh, s such incredible athletes training so hard and also have w at least one good leg to yeah. really do all the dynamic <clears throat> stuff. And for me, I rely 100% on the mechanics of these feet. Yeah. And they just, they're very limited compared to what the human foot can do. So I do realize, though, that that's what my drive is. My drive is to figure it out. It's frustrating, <laughs> but it's also rewarding, especially when I meet, say, other young double leg amputees mm -hmm. who say, oh, my God, I want to go to the Paralympics That's for snowboarding. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. What was it like the final round? Because you made it to the championship race, right? To the, yes. So the final race to essentially like the medal race. Yeah. What was that? How many girls are in that final? So for us, um, since that was the first Paralympics, mm -hmm. it was a much smaller field. Yes. Um, our first snowboard event in the Paralympics. It was a much smaller field. And actually, we didn't do the typical four by four. Or, really? Um, yeah. That, it was more that timed? Or? It's, it was timed. <clears throat> and the reason they did. If you did, hit each other, it's hard to get up. It's hard to whatever, right? Well, they just, uh, they just, for, there was a kind of a safety thing that yeah. they just didn't know. Yet, uh, we had trained quite a while f um, for two years doing time trials. They just decided, let's just do the time trials and make it go off of that instead of doing head-to-head. -head. Gotcha. Because they couldn't quite figure out the classifications. You know, I'm a double-leg amputee, and then I'm competing against an above-the-knee amputee, and then there's a girl with legs who yeah. maybe has, a, a, you know, a bit of um, uh, MS or something, mm -hmm. impairment in there. So they just decided, let's just do time runs smart. and whoever has the best time wins, you wow. know, for second, third. Um, now though, going into the next games, it is side by side. It's actually really, really exciting and crazy that way. But, um, but yeah, just, just for one, just being, you know, being in Russia, being at the Olympics, being in the Olympic village is, it, it makes me emotional because mm. it's just so cool, you yeah. know? And, and then, gosh, I mean, just the day of the race, it's almost like your whole life sets you up to that moment. You know, I wouldn't have been there if I didn't lose my legs, you know. Wow. And then, yeah, I mean, it's, and we get a countdown. We're in the gates and, you know, you hear the guy go three, two, <clears throat> like racers ready, you know, three, two, one, go. And I mean, those moments are some of the most intense moments because once you pull out of that start gate as hard it's as it. you can oh it's, my god my heart is know. like pounding just listening to this yeah it's a dream you know it's like it oh, it's been my dream as a kid and uh, yeah it's like i can only imagine how emotional it is yeah you know? and to sh actually try to keep those emotions at bay yeah because focus on the, the goal yes. you've been working on this your whole yeah. life focus <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't mess it up right now but yeah i mean you know easily standing in those gates you know i thought of everything that happened in my life wow. that led me there all the people who are rooting for me all the people who supported me and mm. um i mean we even had throughout the years because we race in a dangerous sport we even had major major injuries with some of the athletes we had one athlete who passed away in oh, one man. of our races right before sochi oh. so all of that though is what you know comes to you in the start gates yeah. it's like everything it took to get there you know and then um but then you know you have to use that as power yeah. versus like broke down fear emotional whatever, yeah. yeah and and yeah then pulled out of the start gates and um <clears throat> it was very challenging for us we were in sochi the snow was very very weird it was Different. like yeah, it was like quicksand. Oh. It was really interesting. They'd spray the stuff on it to try to harden it up, but it would make it like glue. It was really mm. weird. So, so your time like, was slow compared to other places. Yeah, you'd like dig your edge in and it would actually, you'd kind of sink, in. sink instead of cutting through. You know, you'd go slower. And so we had to be lighter on our edges and it was a whole different type of riding wow. than we're used to. And um yeah, and I, I ended up coming in third place and was absolutely 
I mean, so grateful. What was that know? like when they put the medal around your neck? Amazing. They don't play the national anthem unless you win, correct? Um, how did we do that? Let me think. I think we all, they did the national For anthem. each person. Third, second, then first. Yeah, yeah, when we did the award ceremony. Wow. They do an award ceremony, or they do a flower ceremony right after the race on the snow. So they bring up the top three uh-huh. and give you flowers, and then I think they played later our, that night is the, the yeah, medal. Or, yeah, yeah wow. that night's the medal ceremony, and that was emotional. I can imagine. Yeah. Did you get the rings too, tattooed? Um, no, I didn't. I haven't, but I know a lot of people who have. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, I, I know. I've, I've kind of thought of it, but, you know, I do have I have the rings ring. I don't have it on me right now, oh, but usually, cool. you know, to have that Olympic ring, um, to Gosh, be able to look down and so see amazing. it is pretty, you know, it's just crazy. I mean, it's so cool. And so I, I was so grateful um, because of everybody who supported me, everything that we went through, you know, to be able to be there, represent anybody with a disability or anybody yeah. who, you know, had an adversity and didn't think that they could do something, yeah. you know, powerful with their lives Amazing. to be able to, to be there and kind of represent that. And, um, yeah, I mean, and then just knowing that all your hard work paid off, there was a little bit of Feels a good, relief, right? right? It was <laughs> like, good. thank God. Like, thank God I actually brought metal home because I really had my heart set on it. You know, that's what your whole oh couple years gosh. leading up is just bringing home a wow. metal. Like, every minute that I didn't work out, I knew somebody else was working out harder yeah. than me, and you needed to be ahead of the game. And so... Crazy. It's, well, it takes all of you. Congrats you know? on getting this, the bronze. Yeah. It's amazing. Thank you. Now, how did Dancing with the Stars come about then? Yeah, that um, that was interesting. So I'll tell you what, everything happens for a reason. Yes. It really does. Or It's either that or you make do with what you're given and then it makes sense, mm-hmm. right, in the end. But um, I – so that year leading up to the Paralympics, I actually got this random opportunity to um, – to do a movie with Samuel L. Jackson, hmm. and before it was, the Paralympics, and you didn't really have a platform before, no. correct? Like you well, kind of, I had a TED Talk uh-huh. um, that I did in 2011, which and, is like what people that they give the new speakers <laughs> yeah. to say, "Watch this because it's how you need to give a TED Talk." It, yes, it's crazy, right? Isn't that crazy? Amazing. And apparently, my TED Talk um, is used by the TED organization to say, this is how you do it. Right, right, talk. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. And I did that. I mean, when I first started speaking and I guess going back to that quickly, I, um, I mean, that was the most challenging thing I've ever done at that time in my life. <laughs> right. did, did you do a TED talk? I've been asked to do many, but I'm, I'm waiting for the right <gasps> okay. time. Yeah. You'll I'm know. waiting. I've got the speech in mind and I've yeah. been practicing and I'm like, you're practicing. Just waiting. I've been waiting. You know, um, it's all about timing for me. Yeah. I, so I kind of just jumped in good. feet first and made myself create the best talk that I could create at that time. You That's know, great. I put so much work into it because I knew that with a TED talk, you could just get through it. That's fine. Or it can absolutely launch mm-hmm. you into a whole different, you know, whole dimension world. of work and speaking and everything. And, um, I remember I loved Ted leading up to Mm. it. And so when I was asked, I I remember I cried when I opened this email and I said, oh my God, I've been invited to speak at Ted. And I had only spoke at very few places before that, but somehow the flyer for one of my speeches ended up on one of the Ted organizers desks. And from that flyer, I was invited to speak. And, um, I was given about three months. I worked harder than I've ever worked in my life right. because I thought, you know, how do you, I was 30. So how do you, how do you round 30 years into an eight minute talk? Yeah. And, and. Which rap- stories to tell? There's so yeah, many stories. there's so many. I mean, my talk it started out like an hour and a half long. <laughs> You're like, okay. Yeah. And I wanted every it. story yeah. in there. But then, um. Something that that helped me is the theme. So it's always, I don't know about you, but it's always easier for me if a company or a group says, okay, our theme is um, living beyond limitations or our theme is passion or mm-hmm. I can wrap my head around that. But when people come and say, we just want to hear your story. That's a little bit harder for me. It's so general. Yes. I need to know who are the people I'm speaking to. Like, what are they looking for? What are they struggling with? Like, what kind of, um, where can I wrap my ideas around? Right. And 
with Ted, they gave me, um, they just said beyond borders. That Mm -hmm. was the theme. And they had so many different speakers. You know, they had someone talk about actual physical borders and Mm -hmm. someone talk about um, emotional borders. And for me, those borders were the limitations in my life. Um, And I was able to start thinking of, okay, you know, how does that play a role in my life? And, And how for me, those limitations are actually how I got where I'm at today. Yes. Like it's using those, you know, and for me, that's where my theme of kind of pushing yeah. off of those borders, pushing off of those limits came. And that talk um, went viral, you know, all that hard work. I mean, I didn't that's eat, great. sleep, anything for three months <laughs> and it all paid off it's and amazing. it went viral and and um, and put me into a corporate speaking yeah, career. Great. And so I had that <clears throat> going into the Paralympics mm-hmm. and before doing Dancing with the Stars. Right. And Dancing with the Stars just, it actually came up about two weeks before I went for, to the Paralympics. No way. Yeah. They, Crazy. I'll tell you what, they called me in November. The Paralympics were in March. They called me in November and just said, are you interested? Do you like dancing? And are you interested? And I said, well, I love dancing like at the club. I mean, I can go out <laughs> and dance, but that doesn't mean that I can be a ballroom dancer. Yeah. And that was it for our conversation. And I kind of moved on. Um, and then about two weeks before, we got the official invitation to be on the show. And honestly, I was just like, Sure. I mean, I, I, I really didn't watch the show. I I knew about it, of course, but I, it's not like I religiously watched it. I had no idea what to expect. I honestly thought that I'd make it through like the first week. Well, I hoped to make it through the first week, but certainly did not go in with any crazy expectations. Um, had no idea what to expect at all. And, um, you made it to the semis, right? I I made it. So I came in second place. Yeah. Came in second place. The last show. And that's all I could have asked for. That's it. I'm telling Make it you, to the end. To be able to experience every moment of that show, I feel so blessed. Wow. I mean, yeah, of course, you know, you want, we're competitive and you want to, you know, you you win. get that close. Yeah. You want to win. But it wasn't about that. It really wasn't. It was mm-hmm. just every week was a discovery, trying to yeah. figure out how, how do I do this? And how do we come up with moves that, that I can that do work, and that yeah. work and that, You know, we didn't want it to look like I had prosthetic legs. Mm -hmm. I never wanted anyone to say, oh, she's good for a girl with prosthetics. Uh You know, I want to be, if I'm in there competing, I want to be looked at as any other dancer who wants to do well. And so um, Derek and I did everything we could. We worked our butts off to, you know, to, I guess, make it as far as we did. He's a great choreographer and he's amazing. He's amazing. Uh, Just seriously genius He's intense too he's like focused, oh yeah. committed super intense wow. yeah. yeah super intense but also hilarious at the same time yeah yeah he's, he's a got good the dude. funniest personality he's a good dude he's i've a- got t- i've had a chance to hang out with him a few times he's a nice guy yeah but uh i watched a couple of you guys performances and they're just mind-blowing you know and you guys you guys had the judges in tears like every time right. so it's like you created you created an emotional yeah. connection to the heart of everyone so yeah. it was really cool to see that yeah. you can continue to break the borders and the boundaries, right? Yeah, and that's what was interesting is every week <clears throat> we created something and had different feet, and mm-hmm. it came out of necessity. I didn't use the feet just because they were cool. You know, one week would be with running blades and next week <laughs> would be with, like, these tippy-toe feet. And we did it out of necessity. Like, I needed to be able to get a certain look and shape and action out of the foot, so we had to get really creative with yeah. the feet. But... I remember leading up to um, the semifinals, we had used up all my feet, kind of. We hadn't used my running blades yet. Right. I never even thought of using my running blades. They were in Colorado, and, you know, you film out here in L.A. And um, I remember Derek and I just thinking, like, gosh, we, like, you know, we've kind of fi- figured, not figured it all out, but, like, what are we going to do this week that's um, different, dynamic yeah. and different? And and then we found out we had the quick step, which was something that Derek was worried about with me because you really have to travel. So you have to have that bounce to your feet. You mm-hmm. can't like stay in one spot. And um, just last minute, I think actually, I think it was my husband was like, why don't you try uh, your running blades? And he overnighted them to me. We got them on like a Wednesday. You know, the show then airs the following Monday. Wow. So that Wednesday, we started playing around and just, you know, choreographed it quickly. And it ended up being so cool. I had no idea that I could run and run <laughs> or dance in running blades. <clears throat> it's amazing. Uh, yeah. And wow. um, we were just like, gosh, there's just there's endless possibilities if you're really willing to work for it. Yeah. What, what did yeah. that do for your, you know, 
for you in general being on that show and getting that far and yeah what was like the biggest thing that came from it or you know yeah i i just great for you you know i think personally (coughs) it just um you know just reinforced the idea that we're capable of so much because you're under so much pressure and every week you think you can't do it honestly like every week i feel like you know two days before the show it seems impossible you can't remember the dance you're making mistakes you're just (laughs) kind of praying that you do well and then you do it and every week you do it and then you get injured and you push through that and you're still dancing even though you're in so much pain (laughs) but you're like still you know dancing it and by the end I think you just realize like you're made of so much I mean you're so capable Mm -hmm. of getting of pushing through injury and um, fear and pressure and just if you can push through all of that what you're capable of doing is um, is you know amazing and so for me just kind of personally to have that to know I did that I made it through that I can make it through anything Mm. um, was good and then and then after that I think what it did too is it kind of just brought my story and I I guess what I do um, to the attention of others right so I I went on after that and did a speaking tour with Oprah Mm. but you know that didn't even come from Dancing with the Stars Um, that came from a whole different direction even though I connected with Oprah on the show which is interesting but my sponsor Toyota was sponsoring her um, she was doing this big speaking tour so it was kind of through Toyota that I was able to what was this tour called it's called the Life You Want Tour was this a couple summers ago? or Yeah, it was. with Rob Bell and Liz Gilbert. Yes. Were they on it? Oh, yep. yes. I had, uh, Rob's a good buddy of mine. Really? He's been on the podcast. And Liz yeah, Gilbert's coming on this oh. Sunday. She's going to be in studio. Is she? Yeah. yeah. You know, so I am doing <laughs> a, an interview with Elizabeth Gilbert next yeah. next month. She's great. She's amazing. Yeah. And how crazy is this? Um, so during that time period when I lost my legs and I was kind of at my worst, you know, I was watching Oprah, I was watching Elizabeth Gilbert, Mm -hmm. I was watching and listening to Deepak Chopra. And then all of a sudden I was on a speaking tour with them. Crazy. Yeah. Isn't it nuts? And it was at the same time that my book was coming out. Oh my gosh. And I literally just knocked on all of their dressing room doors. You know, we kept it, we hung out kind of at that time anyways, but I knocked on all their doors, was able to hand them my book. Oh my gosh. Deepak and um, Elizabeth um, endorsed my book. Oh my which gosh. Is, isn't that crazy? Incredible, right? And I just, that's, those are the moments <laughs> where it's just, you know, life is amazing. Oh my gosh. It's more than serendipitous. It's like this was an aligning of the stars that yeah. happened. And without this obstacle, you wouldn't have these opportunities. Right. None of this would happen. No. But yet it doesn't just come out of the sky either. Right. You, you can't, you know, you can't um, have a challenge and decide to, you know, just lay in bed all day right I mean, you have to you go out there you work 14 years <laughs> yeah and then eventually things come together but wow. really you know it's the persistence of your passion that um it's amazing helps you succeed what's your biggest fear moving forward you've created so much do you have any fears with what's ahead <sighs> gosh um i don't know i i think do i have any major fears I, i'm sure i do and i'm sure i'll think about some mm. when i walk out of here so certainly you know i think i'm just as fearful as anybody else but i'm yeah. trying to think of anything that coming up i think um i just don't want to waste the opportunity we have being here on this earth yeah. learning what we're supposed to learn i want to i want to experience it i want to experience what i'm supposed to experience here and so i i don't want to waste um I don't want to waste time, you know, because it can, yeah. it, you know, our lives can end tomorrow. I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing here sure, before sure. it's over. I guess. What's the vision? What's your mission then, moving forward? Gosh, this is all. I, I'm a motivational speaker. I should. Know. I didn't prepare her, so no, not at all. The whole is against her. Yeah, no. <laughs> I um. What is my mission moving forward? I mean, just to live a passionate, inspired life, mm-hmm. honestly. And I say that because yes, it is a little general mm-hmm. because I have so many different passions. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I can't say oh, I just want to come to LA and be an actress, <laughs> but <laughs> I would love to um be a superhero with running blades in a action in a movie. Action movie, or yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, but that's just a fun, creative uh-huh. idea. But um. But I would love to write another book, and I love that I get to travel the world and speak. Actually, this is the first year that I, I, I believe in the power of intention. Mm-hmm. I believe in putting your dreams and your goals out there. And 
at the beginning of this year, actually, I'll go back to last year. I said, I, um, this year I want said, to, I will be on the school of greatness podcast. Yes. <laughs> just kidding. But I said, I'm going to be an international speaker. I did mm. a lot of speaking. I have spoken internationally a little bit, mm. but I did a lot of speaking, you know, here in the U S yep. and this year I decided I want to see the world. I want to travel around the world. I want to experience it and I want to get paid to do it. Mm. I, well, <laughs> and, I, I will put, I'm putting out there that from this interview, someone's going to be listening from Dubai. Buy or Australia, and they're yeah. going to email you, and they're going to say, "I heard you from the School of Greatness <laughs> podcast. Right. We want you to come to Australia. We want you to come here. It's going to happen." See how amazing that is. I it's mean, how happen. that happens. So already this year, I've um, been to Japan. I've been to Singapore. I've wow. been to China, Europe. Next week, I'm going to Prague, and then um, and then I just got another speaking engagement in China. But amazing. it's amazing because you just put it. You know, you, you got to say it. It's energetic, <clears throat> but it's also making those connections. You have yeah. to say. This is not what I hope to do or what I'm going to try to do. This is I'm what I'm doing. This. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing how I think the universe and the people around you come together and make that yeah. become a reality. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I want to ask you a couple final questions. I know we got to get out of here in a second, but I'm so excited about your story <laughs> and I'm so glad we could get here Thank you. and do this. Uh, but for those that don't have your book, it's called On My Own Two Feet From Losing My Legs to Learning the Dance of Life. Make sure to go pick it up. I tried to get it in Barnes & Noble. It was out of stock. So go order it on Amazon yes. or, or tell them to restock it if <laughs> they don't have it. Um, final few questions that I have. What are you most grateful for in your life recently? Recently? Oh, my gosh. Um, I think but this isn't just recently. I'm just going to say I'm always grateful for my health. Mm -hmm. Because so every three months I get um, my blood drawn to make sure that my kidneys are good because yeah. I have a kidney transplant. And... Every time I get my blood drawn and my numbers come back good, I feel like it's a new lease on life. Wow. I think I'm healthy. I can do anything. I'm not going to waste, you know, the moments that I have. I think that also keeps me on my toes because, you know, my kidney could fail at any time. Um, just they're not permanent. They're not considered a permanent mm. fix. It's a temporary fix at any time your kidney could fail. You could you know, be on machines again and on a transplant list. And so every yeah, day wow. that I'm healthy, I'm grateful. It's a good day. It's a, yeah, absolutely. And wow. luckily every three months I kind of get that like reminder. Of like, oh my gosh, I'm healthy. That's huge. Yeah. You know? It's so, precious. Every day is precious. Yeah. You never know when. Yeah. Why did you decide, we were talking before, you said you're going to go back to the um, Paralympics. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to go back? Uh, it's in two years, right? Yeah. Where is it going to be? 2018 in South Korea. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Go back? It was a little bit challenging to decide if I was going back or not because I, in a way, kind of checked that box, mm -hmm. you know, went on to do many things after that. And then now, kind of going back around and going um, back into training, it takes every Full part time, of you. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I think it has just a bigger meaning for me now. It's, it's It has a bigger purpose. I actually this year was competing so i got i took t about two years off um and or, to let's speak say, and do dancing with the stars yeah. Yeah, yeah and after that i was not that i was burned out but i was tired <laughs> you yeah. know it's like i'm going to i'm not going to compete this year so i took actually like a year and a half off of snowboard and then this year i went back and started competing doing the world cups and it was incredibly mm -hmm. challenging hmm. because all the other competitors have been working for the last two years and I took a break. You can't so, just step up there and still be great. You no, know? Yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah, like you can't, um, you can't, uh, you know, you don't become an Olympian by half-assing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you have yeah. to be 100% in. Sure. And so I came in as very much so an underdog this year. I struggled a lot with my legs. I wanted them to do more, and I was testing different legs out. And I, I did well in some competitions and horrible in other competitions. And really, it just felt like a bit of a struggle this year. And then... I was in Italy and I was having a little bit of a, a rough day and I got a phone call at about 11 o'clock at night um, and meanwhile I'm in a tiny tiny village in Italy mm -hmm. I mean up in this like little Italian Alp yeah. village and at 11 o'clock at night I got a phone call from the front desk that um, that somebody was there to see me. So I went downstairs, and I mean, I was in my pajamas. I was already in bed. I went downstairs, and this young Italian girl who was probably about 17, who had two prosthetic legs, was standing there with her mom, her grandparents, mm. 
her leg maker and her snowboard coach and they drove four hours they wow. they heard i was in this little town they drove four four hours to meet me um and really all they wanted to know is how she can do what i'm doing like yeah and they all had so many questions as far as well how do you get your ankles to move mm-hmm. how do you get that how do you keep your legs on yeah. how do you do this how do you do that and you know i was showing them my legs and how they work and everything we kind of figured out and um just the fact that i mean she was obviously so determined to have her leg maker there her snowboard coach everything every her whole, team. Her whole yeah. team and that's what you need and i just you know wow. i walked away feeling so good thinking here i'm in this little village in the Alps, you don't even, you know, you don't even know that people know you're there, yeah. would care that you're there. And then the fact that this one girl, just knowing that, um, I guess my experience has shown or my journey has inspired her mm-hmm. and, and given her hope that she can do that as well. It, 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 for me, I thought that's why I'm doing this. It's not about me, you yeah. know. Or and it's not about you. You have to be into it. You have to be incredibly into it, right? You have to be mm-hmm. com- completely passionate about it. But I think my reason for going back and training again for the next um, Paralympic team is different than it was before. Yeah. Like this time, it's not about me. It's not about for you to win something or yeah. achieve something. It's to make a bigger impact. Exactly. Inspire. Right. Yeah. And who can, you know, that day was so rough for me because I didn't win and I was struggling mm-hmm. and, you know, and I realized, but it's not about that. Like yeah. I'm out here and I'm yeah. doing it and I'm figuring it out. And that's what it's about. It's yeah. about that journey. You know, it's not like, okay, we're going to fail constantly. Mm. So what keeps you going? You know, it Amen. can't be about the medals. That's great. Okay. Uh, if you could, if you had to tattoo a word on your head mm-hmm. or a phrase or a saying that was in reverse. So that every time you looked in the mirror, only you could see it. Okay. A word or a phrase or a saying, and every time you looked at it, it was just a reminder that you could read it. Yeah. What would that word or phrase be? Um, live inspired. That's, I love that because mm. it's just about living an inspired life. Like, I believe inspiration is contagious. Mm. Um, when you see, and I actually, I'll go back to Derek Huff with this. He's so passionate yeah. and he's so inspired when he's creating Um it's it rubs off on you you see somebody who's passionate about what they're doing it makes you feel like you can do that too whatever it is you know you want that in your life to be excited and passionate and so um i think it's about keeping yourself inspired and for me i never set out to be inspiring Mm -hmm. you know i don't wake up in the morning and think that's my job is to inspire people that's what i want to do is inspire people I wake up and do the things that inspire me yeah. and I'm around the people who inspire me and, um, and that makes me want to do more. And then, you know, hopefully people kind of feed off of that and that makes them want to do more. Mm-hmm. So just living <clears throat> a completely inspired, passionate life. That's great. I love it. Okay. This is one of the questions I asked at the end for people. Um, it's called the three truths. Okay. Three truths question. And again, Amy's not prepared here. So not at all. This is off the cuff, whatever comes to mind. Okay. Uh, but let's say it's uh, many, many years down the road and it's your last day. Okay. And you know it's the last day. There's of my life. Last day. And okay. It, they're actually saying, come here. We want you to come here and you have to go this day. <laughs> yeah, right. Get and, uh, and you know it's happening. And uh, you have, uh, you know, you're, everyone there that loves you is there. And it's a harmonious, peaceful moment. And people say, okay, you have a piece of paper and a pen, and you get to write down three simple truths. So the three things you know to be true about everything you've experienced in your life. And this is essentially the three things that will, you know, be the lessons of our lives. Okay. What would be the message that you would write down, those three truths of all your experiences on how your message to the world? Okay, quickly, are these words, are they phrases, anything? Sentences, phrases. three things, Okay. It could be a whole story, but it could be short. Or okay, um, um, it's all about love. Mm. Number one, not just you know uh, romantic love. I mean love, like loving yourself, putting love out there. Love is creativity. Love is passion. Um, it is sharing what you have with the world. That's love. It's all about love. Second thing is to um, <coughs> use your limitations to push off of. I mean, they're not there necessarily to slow you down. They're there to hopefully build you up um, and to push off of them and see what amazing places you can go. And the third thing is that it will all make sense in the end. Mm. 
Those are powerful. Sorry. I love those. Take them. <laughs> uh, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Amy, for your incredible inspiration and oh, your incredible you. love that you have for yourself, which I think is important that we have self love, no yeah. matter what the challenge is, that we love ourselves. You have to. And the love that you bring into the world. Oh, thank you. And uh, it's an incredible example of what's possible mm. when things maybe don't go the way we want them to go to see what you've created and all the inspiration you bring into the world. So I really acknowledge you for your courage, your love, and your inspiration. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're awesome. Thank you're you welcome. So much. And before I ask the final question, uh, I want to make sure everyone go get the book. It's called On My Own Two Feet. Pick it up. We'll have it linked up in the show notes here right afterwards. Where do you hang out on social media the most? Where should we connect with you? Watch. Probably. I know we on Snapchat. We got all that going. <laughs> I got all that going yes. for sure. Still learning about Snapchat, but it is yep, funny. You do fun. all your funny day-to-day -day things <laughs> on there. Um, but Instagram is my favorite. I'm okay. a really visual person. I love photography. I love doing photography, so mm. I post a lot of like, you know, just cool pictures of nature. And, yeah. you know, but also I do a lot of obviously like athletic things, so I – do uh, I post, you know, some workout inspiration on nice. there. I've seen some um, of your stuff with the, uh, you were doing like crunches the other day with the straps or whatever, the yeah. T-Rex straps, whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah. They, they were rings actually. Rings, so they were, yeah, you're bringing your knees in. And, yeah. Right. And then, um, yeah, so I just, I love, I love Instagram mm. and I love connecting with um, people on there as well. The and Amy Purdy Girl? It's at Amy Purdy Girl. Okay, cool. And it's G -U -R -L. yeah, G U R L, Amy Purdy Girl. Okay. And that's the same for um, Twitter, Snapchat, same username, and Facebook as well. Cool. Awesome. So, so we'll make sure to go follow you there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the final question is what's your definition of greatness? Oh my gosh, my definition of greatness. Oh, now I feel put on the spot because you're <laughs> so amazing. You've like, oh, no. created the definition of greatness. Um, <laughs> Definition of great, it's just absolutely being the best that you can be. You know, we all have different circumstances. Um, it is using what you have um, to get ahead. Mm. Yeah. Amy, thank you so much for coming yeah. on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank appreciate you. It. Hey guys, Lewis Howes here, and thanks so much for checking out this video and this interview. I hope you loved it. If you did, make sure to leave a comment below and share this with your friends. Also, I've got a huge announcement. The Summit of Greatness is coming very soon. If you love the School of Greatness podcast, if you love these interviews and you want more, you want to connect with some of these speakers in person, you want to connect with me and other people just like you who watch and listen to these interviews, then make sure to sign up for The Summit of Greatness. Go to summitofgreatness.com to learn more. You can check out more about the video that we have that we created for the summit. There's a link in the description below as well. It's summitofgreatness.com. Check it out right now. I hope to see you there. And again, thanks so much for watching this video.